hush, hush. Somebody's calling my name. I'm so proud of my grandfather and my father. My baby, he would always say, never be ashamed of who you are. And never be ashamed of where you come from. Bear Creek, Irving's traditionally black community, stands at a crossroads. On one hand, progress beats at her door, bringing bulldozers, better job opportunities, and skyrocketing land prices. On the other, development threatens a way of life that has nurtured generations with a sense of belonging. And I think about the words of the Bible that says, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Well, now, we've had some good products come out of this community. So I'm, I'm proud to be living out here. This is my home, and I'm proud of it. And I'm proud of being one of the first families that had a home in this area. And we, and we are still here. And the property is still here. may not be next year, but it's still here now. So this I'm proud of. We've kept this land together. I love here. I've been around here all my life, and I love here. And, uh, I'm, I'm intending to stay here. I don't know what's going to come to. Uh, you know, I hear people talking about saving uh, downtown Irving. The Bear Creek community probably has more heritage and history than downtown Irving does, but there hasn't been the same concern about that. Life in Bear Creek has never been easy. Poverty still festers just feet away from luxury. Unemployment still loiters just yards away from commerce. And illiteracy still lingers just blocks from education. But life in Bear Creek is easier than it used to be. As a young man, 91-year-old Walter Holmes picked cotton for 75 cents a day. From can't to can't, do you know what that means? When the sun rises, you got to be there sitting there waiting. When the sun goes down, you got to be at the barn taking your harness off your mule, and that means after sundown. You understand? That's after sundown, not before. And this man may over here on the cross the field, if his cotton is real bad, or he might say, I'll give you, I'll give you a quarter more to come over there. Now he's taking me away from this man to go over there for a quarter more. That may difficult. And quite naturally, in those days and time, you might not have to do that, and that makes hard feeling. Well, not the most. And if he see you uptown this evening, say he log to whoop you till your head fall off. All such stuff is there. Mr. Holmes' grandfathers, Pinky Holmes and Jim Green, were born slaves. But in the 1850s, Jim Green became the first black landowner in Bear Creek. Holmes recalls his grandfather. He was a good man. He's good to his wife, I know that. He's good to his kid, good to his stock, good to all of that. The best. 
Keep it there. In the 1860s, as black families began moving into the area, Jim Green started a mission. A freedom school was built next door. Many of the newcomers came seeking a better life after emancipation from slavery. Among them, Ben and Rose Dilworth. My grandfather was in South Texas, and he, I used to use the word migrate, but then they moved here. They came here from, they left Austin, Texas in the spring of the year, and it was January when they got here. And on their way here, we didn't have roads paved, they were just dirt roads. And it was the wagon train, I'm sure it was a group of people, got families got together and formed the wagon train. And in touring here, it was 17 of them in my, well, it was 19 all together with my grandfather and grandmother. And in touring here, some became ill and died on the way. And I think when they made it here, it was at least 14 children because my grandmother became ill also. But on their way here, they stopped and picked cotton or whatever that was, that was to do on the farmlands on their way here. They worked all the way to here. When they got here, it was in wintertime. Unlike Jim Green, most of the newcomers had never owned land. When they first found out about their freedom, they were happy. But of course, he nor his mother had been mistreated because they had worked in that. But a lot of people were glad to be free. But some did not want to leave the plantations they were on. They didn't know what they were going to do. How are we going to make it? We don't know, they didn't have educations. We don't know anything but farming. And they had never farmed a farm of their own. They had never owned property of their own. But by 1900, nine black families owned land in the area west of Beltline Road in the area between Shady Grove Road and Highway 183. Minnie and Nora Shelton owned land off Hard Rock Road where the early settlers buried their dead. Vandalized by time and naughty boys, the cemetery on the hill echoes the names of Bear Creek settlers. cemetery at Compton Road and Conflans cradles their descendants. When this life is over, gonna fly away. Be so very happy. Although many of their children have moved to other areas, family ties keep calling them back. I bought this place here when they got older, where if anything happened to them, I did never want to see my mother and father suffer. So I bought this place next door to them. Close family ties bind four and five generations to Bear Creek. Dwight Green, a choral director at Sam Houston Middle School, lives on land handed down from his family. Green is working on his PhD. Members of the Lighthouse Choir he directs also trace their roots to the original settlers, the Sheltons and the Shivers. Robert Shivers says he worked day and night to buy his home and educate his children. Education, the privilege of the leisure class, eluded the older generation. Not the only education I got. That's bad. Now you talking about bad, that's bad. 
And I see these young boys going up and down the streets now. Should be in school, if they know like I know. Education is a wonderful thing. Farm work left little time for book learning. Well, we always had a responsibility. Uh, our father, you know, when, we, when I was coming up, when I was a child, well, we had a responsibility. Even at home, we had, uh, well, we raised hogs, you know, and we had one or two cows to milk, and we had, you know, mules, you know, to work, you know, the ground with. And we had chickens, and uh, each one had a job, you know, such as feeding the uh, hogs, uh, cows, or mules, you know. And, uh, well, it wasn't enough for everybody at one time, but it's like you would take time about, you know, say, like I would feed, you know, this today, and uh, brother would feed next. We all had a responsibility and work, you know. We always had to work. We didn't have a lot of, whole lot of spare time to play, you know, and uh, as children do today, you know. Across the street is where my father share crop with uh, Mr. Hall uh, for many years. He was in vegetable farm raising, cattle raising, hog raising. Sharecropping, farming another man's land, was a way of life for many people until after World War II. And without the family farm, many residents would have starved. Well, everybody, you know, Work really uh, mostly lived off the land, you know. We raised practically what we, you know, our, uh, such as food, you know, stuff like that. Today, those who work the land do so because they enjoy it. Among them, Claudia Brown, who moved to Bear Creek from West Texas 13 years ago. Mrs. Brown sells her vegetables to supplement her retirement income. Kids call me the farmer. <laughs> like others in the community, she is not afraid of hard work. Lonnie Brigham runs a barbecue catering business. If you qualify for a job or position and you have this, uh, the knowledge of the schooling it takes to do, whatever job is open, I feel like that you could obtain it. You should be able to obtain it or they should be accept your application. I feel like some, so many uh, ones out here, they, they really don't want a job. Don't want nothing really substantial. You know, that's the various ones, you know, I know to be around, bagging around, is doing nothing. They don't want a job. Did they could uh, go down and convince? I know I never had no problem. Anytime I wanted a job, I go out and get it. But others in the community say the commercial buildings springing up on Conflans Road are not hiring local people. We got plenty of jobs right here in the community that we live in, but we, we can't get them. They bring people from Dallas, out of town, everywhere else, and get them a job. But they can't get any own people, community jobs. There's nothing wrong with out here. Just no jobs out here. That's, that's what's wrong. When I was coming up, most young people would take any job. But uh, if you come and say, well, John, I need you to work. First, next word I'm going to ask you, how much you pay? That's something blowed off or not. Uh, so how much you pay? Well, that ain't enough. I'll do anything that they put me on doing. I would do anything they put me on doing, you know what I mean? Uh, yeah, what else? But they, they just not hiring. I, I ain't nobody out here working. You know, they just don't, I guess they bring their own people in to work. I apply for jobs out here and they turn, you know, never did hear from them. The early settlers, however, had no trouble finding work. Well, this is what I do know for a fact. Grandma Ellison. I hear her coming through every morning. Not every morning, she come here every Saturday morning. Before we get up, Call Papa Pinky, Pinky, get up. She said, Pop, I ain't got no coffee. Well, she said, well, he said, well, she said, I got to boot, boot them on. I'm going to Grapevine. You see what I mean? Grandma Ellison walked from right down here. Come into Grapevine. And it wasn't nothing but, wasn't nothing but timber and stuff and wood. 
And so in the evening, about a little before dark, she'd come back. Now mind what I'm going to tell you. She had a 24-pound sack of flour, had it over in her head, over her head, and, and two buckets in her arm. Just walking it away. Walk all the way from Grapevine and never set it down. The early settlers survived hard times by helping one another. Back in them day, we were close, more close than we are today. People seemed like that they were more concerned about one another. And they believed in uh, helping one another, you know, when they could. And, uh, and, and you know, they need help if uh, like if uh, just such, well, anything is, as I said, when we were, even our crop, when we raised a crop a lot of times, it would, uh, it rained quite a bit, a lot more than it do now. And uh, maybe that uh, where one family have got had, you know, have got had got his crop worked out before the rain, you know, had brought grass and weeds out of it, and uh, and uh, well, and, uh, we see next uh, neighbor, he didn't have hidden out, you know. Well, we all pitch in, try to help him get hidden, you know. But when times were good, Bear Creek knew how to have a good time. All the families that were brought up in this neighborhood, the south side, north side, we'd all come together and have a big fellowship picnic. You know, it'd be on Sunday, we'd have a big picnic dinner. And all we'd meet the folk we haven't seen in a year, and sometimes two or three years. But see, don't have that now. They got a center over there, but the center just don't take the place of fellowship under these trees. During the 20s and 30s, Blacks came from as far away as Euless and Grapevine to celebrate Juneteenth in an area off Gilbert Road known as Spencer's Prairie. They danced all night long, and when they didn't, weren't dancing, in the daytime, they would stage like we call, you would call them playoffs. And we just said then we'd have three or four football games, I mean, baseball games in the run of a day. Today, the vacant lot next door to Townsville's grocery still reverberates with fellowship. Inside, Jackie Townsell serves lunch. Elected to the city council in 1977, Townsville appeals to a broad constituency. You know, when I stepped out there to run for city council, something I never thought I would do, you know, it just never crossed my mind, but people encouraged me to do it. And uh, when I decided that I was going to give it a shot, well, I felt like that being black and being a woman was definitely against me. So when I went out to campaign knocking on people's doors, I knew that. So I looked for, you know, if anybody slammed a door in my face, I would accept that and just go on to the next door. So it really didn't happen that way, though. You know, I, I had a real good reception. That's what made me run the second time after I lost the first time. <laughs> Bear Creek is one of the most perfect examples of what a man and, and woman can do and what the people of the black community have done to bring themselves uh, into the mainstream of uh, current political life. Jackie Townsell is a shining example of how a, a reasonable person can achieve and uh, be elected to public office and uh, be concerned about every citizen uh, regardless of race or color or creed 
as she has demonstrated over the years. After graduation from eighth grade in 1954, Jackie Howard married Jimmy Townsell. She was 15, but even in her teens, she dreamed of doing something for her community. When I first moved here in 1949, it was February in the winter time, and uh, the roads were, you know, just uh, muddy. And uh, had, you had stumps in the roads, you know, it was just dirt roads. And uh, people had to park, those few that had cars, had to park your car up on the main road and walk down to your house, you know. <laughs> it was that kind of a place. You know, it's about 11 watts, 63 plus something. And I hope you enjoy those. It really stems from my father and his interest in government, I think. Uh, as I was growing up, you know, he always had a deep interest in government, but of course, he felt that there was nothing he could do like contributing um, because of, you know, back in his day, things were just not as good for the black people as it is today in regards to being able to um, have your freedom to do what you want to do. So he talked about a lot of things to me all the time and read the newspaper constantly and try to keep up with what's happening, you know, in Washington and everywhere. So he and I talked about it. My other two sisters didn't really have that much of an interest in it, but I did. So anyway, as I grew older and I got married and all this, then I decided that I was going to join the PTA. And in the meantime, I was already working in the church, serving as the church secretary. And I just, you know, things like that. Just one thing led to another. I like being involved where people are doing things and getting things done. So it's just mushroom from one thing to the other. I look at these young people and I say to myself, boy, if I had had that kind of opportunity when I was a growing up, boy, there's no telling what I might not be now, you know? Um, and I tell some of them that too, but I really think that they ought to grasp the opportunity that is out there for them. It's just, it's just so many things, so many ways that they can get help to be anything they want to be. The desire to help young people realize more of their potential inspired another newcomer. In the 1960s, Kenneth Hearn helped launch the West Irving Improvement Association. I saw a history of, uh, of poverty, and you know this, this, that cycle need, needed to have been broken. And the only way that I saw the cycle was going to be broken was to get involved and let people see themselves in, in, a, in a different light. To make them see that uh, they could accomplish things in life. The idea grew from a Montessori school at the corner of Jackson and Davis. Hearn appealed to the Irving business community for money to buy land for a larger building and a ball field. Uh, $150,000. And it came from uh, various organizations, individuals, uh, uh, different uh, service organizations within the uh, city of Irving, uh, the J Irving JCs. Uh, we received uh, monies from as far away as New York City. I felt I was on a mission, and uh, I felt good about it. Uh, I just felt that God was on our side. I just, just there was no room for defeat. You know, there was no room for failure. But as the community failed to keep pace with his vision, Hearn grew discouraged. I see it doing nothing. I see it sitting there. Forces outside the community, however, were taking their toll. During the 1970s, when the rest of Irving was growing at a frantic pace, the population of Bear Creek dropped from a little over 1,000 residents to under 500. Today, vacant lots are reminders of the more populated times during the 50s and the 60s. Most of the people here felt like that they would get a better, they could live, move into the city of Grand Prairie. At that time, they weren't moving into the city of Irving. And uh, a lot of them moved to Grand Prairie, homesteaded there, because Grand Prairie was like a city to them. And this is where they wanted to be. Grand Prairie offered something Irving did not, federally subsidized housing. Back in the late 60s and early 70s, when uh, the Great Society was being built, whatever that was, there were uh, federal programs standing on every street corner. 
waiting on somebody to apply for them. Uh, the city of Irving was never a city that had a hungry philosophy of taking advantage of every federal program that might exist. Uh, Grand Prairie, on the other hand, to the south, had that philosophy. In fact, I think they got the big award of being an all-American city, primarily because they took advantage of more federal programs than any place in the world. That's how they got to be an all-American city. I don't think it had anything to do with the quality of life in Grand Prairie. It was the fact that they took advantage of more federal programs. So they got the big Blue Ribbon Award. Yet you look at Irving today and you look at Grand Prairie today, and in my opinion, you see two vastly different cities so far as quality and way of life, and Irving far exceeds Grand Prairie in that respect. The quality of life in Bear Creek, however, lagged decades behind the rest of Irving. We didn't have no facilities, you know, such as uh, water, gas, sewer, you know, we, it was a long time, you know, before we had that. What hurt the black race? I could buy this piece of property, but I just say, I didn't have no water, no city streets. If you don't have water, you're in trouble, see? And they thought that we were getting a cheap deal, but it wasn't no cheap deal. So it was just really sort of a no man's land that uh, was totally effectively controlled by the city of Irving because nobody else could do anything, but nothing was being done. The issue of annexing Bear Creek into the city of Irving was not new. The same questions that caused blacks to defeat the issue in earlier years arose again in 1969. So far as the people of Bear Creek were concerned, there were a lot of questions about what would be the impact. Many people had the fear that as soon as they were to be annexed, the city might come down and tear it down their house uh, if the house were built in a substandard way. They were afraid that they might be taxed so high that uh, somebody might uh, suddenly take their property away from them as a result of high city taxes. So those were fears that I think were normal and reasonable fears. And what we had to do and what we did in the course of many meetings that were held with the people was try to bring about a, uh, a feeling of confidence and the elected officials of the city and the administration of the city to where they would believe that such was not going to happen to them. Annexation posed another problem. It cut the community in half. The area south of Rock Island Road became part of Grand Prairie. I never could understand how um, Grand Prairie overlapped Shady Grove. Somebody made an error there, see. Now, Shady Grove was supposed to be in this arid urban district. What little political clout the community wielded was effectively divided by boundary lines dating back to when the county precincts had been drawn. Another critical issue shook the community in 1969. The Irving Independent School District closed the black school. I think one of the things that holds the community together is the schools and the churches. So what we really wanted was to have them with equal education, and we felt that we could do that in our schools, and we even felt that we could bring some white children into our schools because we're surrounded by whites who live here, but they didn't do it. If it had been equipped equally, it would have been the thing to have done is kept it in the community because a community as small as this there's at that time there was no outlet for the people other than going to church and uh, the programs that we had been accustomed to having at the school annually and semi annually the people were deprived of those i think that integration uh, did us a disservice because it seemed to have robbed us of ourselves. Uh, we seemed to have lost our identity. For a hundred years, the black school had served as a unifying force in the community. Our school was over here, right next door. A new school, the school was built, 
in 1917, uh, I was seven years old when I entered this school out here. Sowers II, a one-room schoolhouse with an outhouse and well, educated youngsters through the eighth grade. I felt as a student that the quality education that we received, and I'm presuming that this is what you're speaking of, was much better then than it is now. Because I know they were getting paid, but they cared for you as a pupil, or as a student. They wanted you to get it. You think about one teacher with 80 students, and they all go to high school. Most of them, the bulk of them finished elementary school, went to high school, and some of them became teachers, engineering, or what have you. They were well concerned about the children. Despite the odds, a number of graduates went on to Booker T. Washington Technical School in Dallas, some to college, a few to graduate school. Yes, you had to uh, foot your own bill. You had to catch a bus, ride to Dallas, or either catch the streetcar or walk to Booker T. Washington High. They went to the same school, high school, that I did. In 1949, the school burned after a boy sent to light the furnace got the fire too hot. The community rallied to raise money to buy land for a new school at the corner of Jackson and Davis. Robert Stewart, the first land developer in Bear Creek, donated a second acre. The first uh, school that was on the corner of Jackson and Davis was the Barrack, and it was a two-room deal. They moved the two buildings in there and joined them together and made two classrooms out of them. And they had a breezeway between them. And that's where we had our writing classes in the breezeway. And uh, a year later, they built a room on the back of those two barracks. And uh, we had a third classroom at that time. And we remained that way until, uh, I guess, maybe about uh, 55. But the new school was in for some heat of its own. The county had built a school out here with no equipment, no books, no blackboards, no nothing. We had only one teacher out here and the community had asked for other materials. While the school and the county superintendent said we could not get them. So in order for us to have the materials that we needed, they called in the NAACP. And they decided to form a picket line. We didn't mean to be mean about it, but we just wanted a, you know, a fair deal on education, that's what we want. And uh, so, anyway, we just kept drilling on it like that. And next thing we knew, they were, we told them that the school, you know, we needed another school. We came on, we, we just, up uh, progress is what we wanted to see. And the neighborhood was growing. In 1955, the Irving Independent School District took over from the county. And then they built the brick building, the flat building next to Jackson Street there. And of course, we had a place in which we could have our programs inside. And we had a lunch room there. That was the first uh, cafeteria that we had. And in 60, uh, they built the high school there uh, and named it Joe Davis. The school was not as well equipped as those in other parts of town, but community spirit ran high, as did attendance at PTA. I knew what they were supposed to have, and they didn't have it, and I just went beyond the call of duty and supplied as much of it as I can and taught it. I just wanted the school upgraded, the children getting, you know, I said a, a fair deal, you know give them, them the same uh, books and work just like they were in the other school. But see, they weren't doing that. They were handed down what was left from up there 
came over here, and that's what we did in life. Students excelled in sports, music, and essay writing, winning statewide recognition. Community pride and school spirit peaked in 1961 with Irving's first black parade. And we walked all the way into Irving, and we had our, I had rented instruments, incidentally, the drums and all from Klein Winnemans in Dallas. And this Mrs. Chambers had taught them how to play the, beat the drums and the other instruments that they had. And we went down our second street and up Hastings and came back to the square in Irving. And of course that was the first black parade that they had ever had and they sang and the cheerleaders, they, they were beautiful and of course, I don't know, it's just a tradition of the black children to dance anyway and they put on quite a few stunts downtown Irving. And Integration, begun in 1964, created new problems for Bear Creek. The majority of the children were small and they would have to stand on the roads and wait for buses to pick them up and carry them to school. And of course, it was such a change socially that more, the majority of them uh, were shifted over to special education because they were afraid. Uh, everything was so different to them and many of them had not seen well, they'd seen white people, but they hadn't been around them. And to be thrown into a classroom situation where the majority was whites, naturally it was disturbing to them. And they couldn't do, neither be there best, and they were just nervous, that's all. And they were, many of them went to special education classes. By 1973, Bear Creek youth began to feel the unrest sweeping blacks throughout the nation. A rumble on the football field brought Irving High School to the brink of riot. So for a week, we came to school every day <laughs> and walked the halls. But I was a little bit frightened, <laughs> even though they were all kids. But I was still a little bit frightened because you could just cut the uh, intent. It was just terrible. I mean, you could just cut it with a knife. It was just so, um, the hostility was just really there. And our black kids had hostility towards Reverend Stevenson and I because we were here trying to calm things down. They said, you know, we were taking sides with the white people. And we said, we're here to take sides with everybody. We want to try to work this out. Back in the, in the 60s, you know, there were organizations who organized themselves to um, go into various small communities and help in regards to desegregation. Well, at this particular time, all of the kids were aware of that. And uh, they were aware of the various groups. And so they used that to frighten the kids here at the school, to let them know that they were not alone. The racial tension of the late 60s and early 70s can be traced to an earlier era. I had an uncle. They had run a white man farm. And my uncle had the kid had kidney trouble so bad that he couldn't walk from the end of that door. And that poor white man just made that man just get off him. Get out of my that little gun, damn it, and then kick him and Lord, that made me made my blood boil. But what could I do about it? Uh, kicking. Had a Winchester on the back of his saddle and a forty-five in his hand. I think that was. I think that's ridiculous. I don't care what the hell. That's ridiculous. Ku Klux was bad. You couldn't be out there at the night at all, and you got to be living on a mighty good white man's farm for him not to get you. Despite the Ku Klux Klan, many blacks regarded their white neighbors as friends. It's always been a good spirit, but uh, no race trouble. No, not a bit of race trouble. 
Dr. D.W. Gilbert was a major landowner in Bear Creek. When he died in 1930, a Bear Creek woman wrote this letter to his son. We, the colored people of the surrounding community, regret the passing of this great man. We feel that we have lost a friend. No greater man ever lived. We found Dr. Gilbert to be honest, faithful, and true to his word. In sickness, he has been with us. In trouble, he has never faltered. He was the father of our community. I talk about it because my grandfather was a slave, and he taught us all the beautiful things about life, like uh, not to hate, because it was something that, by him being a minister, he understood it better than we did. And by him being a minister, he told us that uh, we weren't the only people that had been slaves. Religious roots run deep in Bear Creek. Greatest strength in my life, when I met God. This is a church where I went to in the beginning of my early life, and you had to walk up the steps. They had a porch there, and then you entered the sanctuary and walked down inside the church. An awful beautiful church on the inside. Jim Green's mission grew into the CME Shady Grove Church, founded in 1882. Allen Chapel across the street also dates back to the 1880s. In 1941, Mary Jane Morton helped found the Ben Washington Baptist Church, pastored by Reverend J. L. Lott. For four decades, it has served as both a spiritual and civic leader in the community. Today, the church ministers to blacks all over Irving. In 1948, Reverend and Mrs. Elijah Stevenson organized the Evergreen Baptist Church. Today, numerous denominations dot the landscape, reflecting the changing times. Bear Creek's complexion is changing. Wooded hills have given way to expensive homes. Not everyone in Bear Creek welcomes the changing scenery. I think back a lot of times, you know, when I was a boy coming up, you know, when I could just roam around everywhere, you know, where I wanted to go, just as I said that uh, we, I'd like to, uh, I like to hunt a lot. My sport was hunting, and uh, you could just go anywhere, as you know. And uh... Nothing for, for me, what I'm saying to really hooray about is what the community on this development have done for me, have done for the area. But I'm saying it just sort of just bought different one, folks out, and they moved to Grand Prairie, Dallas, and whatever, uptown Irving. So I just continue bringing in all the other industrial sites and all and just move out all the home sites, homeites. So it's not good. It's not good for me. We got big trucks coming through 18 wheels. Walking we I just had a friend got run over by 18 wheels. He's in the hospital now in critical condition. He was walking up the street, going home. And they hit him and kept going. So I don't think it's we didn't need it out here. 1977 marked the end of an era for Bear Creek. That year, work began to widen Conflans Road, opening the area to potential development. And water, sewer, and gas finally extended to the entire community. By 1980, development was in full swing. In the last five years, the population of West Irving has multiplied tenfold, but most of the newcomers are white. Will the oldest surviving black settlement in Dallas County be destroyed by development? You had a very quiet, peaceful, residential community. 
that had developed over the years. It lacked the various services and amenities that people would normally want. So there was a trade-off, uh, so to speak, by those who lived there. They wanted police, they wanted fire, they wanted water, they wanted sewage, they wanted garbage pickup, they wanted parks, they wanted better streets, they wanted those amenities. And those things have come to the area, as was originally represented. But in the process of that, people have seen the opportunity of the area. They have gone out, they have bought large tracts of land, they have put developments on it in the way of homes that are 150,000 or more in value, and those people who are there generally cannot afford to buy those homes. So you have a, a changing face of the community that is occurring as a result of those practical realities that have occurred. Well, uh, you know, uh, they've always wanted this place. It's always somebody trying to buy the whole lump sum like they are now. You see, they'll say that they want to buy, but they say, now, we can't buy unless all y'all sell. In other words, that means all of you got to come together, see. But when they came out here before my place, I let them make two or three trips out here. And they was telling me about where I could get me a brick home, about $110,000, $15,000, how nice it was. And I said, I lived all these years in a frame building. And I said, not too much different than a frame and a brick. And I said, uh, I think I'm going to spend the rest of my life right here. As you drive around the area now and put aside the homes, the new homes that have been built by large developments, there are uh, probably five or six new homes that have been built by people from that area. They offered me, I think, a hundred and... Fifty-nine thousand, Lord. I said, Reverend, you can go buy your brick home and sit down. I said, that's just, just what I don't want to do. Sit down and die. <laughs> well, for the future of Bear Creek, I hope to see us continue to be upgraded in the way of streets and things and, uh, and better housing for some of the people here. And I'm hoping, I'm working right now real hard towards uh, trying to find someone to come in here and take a look at, see at building some type of rental property for people in here. Because we have a lot of our young people who, when they finish high school, they move out to other communities because we don't have that. The way they're building these new houses and stuff, yes, I would like to live here in Barry Creek. In the next few years, I would like to see the light, the ball field over there the lights where they could play ball at night or soccer at night. I would like to see the building uh, renovated. I would love to see a kindergarten. Let me see, I don't want to say kindergarten. I would like to see a head start school back over there. Head start school. I would like to see the senior citizens out here more active. You know, I would hope that there could continue to be a residential community of, of modest homes, if that's what the people want to their home to be, to where one could see that there were people who cast their lot at this particular place in our area. They worked, they farmed, they gardened, they struggled, but they achieved and they raised their families. and. Uh, they made it without all of the modern gadgets and conveniences, simply showing that it, it could be done and it was done in our past by those who uh, came before us. Don't let the neighborhood just die, you know. That's what I feel like. I have peace of mind out here. I'm content. And when I say this, as my Bible tells me, whatever condition you're in, be content. And you can overcome anything. So, when the time comes, I will. But then you don't lose your heritage. You always keep it. <laughs>